Hello and welcome to the Quincy Access Television Studios. I'm Mark Crosby. Welcome to State View, a program that looks at various uh, legislation on Beacon Hill and how it affects you here in the city of Quincy. Joining me today is Senator John Keenan. Senator, uh, welcome. Great, thanks. Thanks for having me again. It's always it's always great to have you Same in. Here. We certainly uh, there's always a lot to talk about, and uh, this show, today's show, is no different. So right. thank you for taking the uh, my pleasure. Thank you the invitation and uh, joining us. Uh, I really want to start with what uh, seems to be in the news almost every day, and that's vaping. And uh, of course, folks will be aware that Massachusetts, the governor has enforced, has put in place a four-month ban on vaping products. Uh, talk about that. Talk about the concern. There is an illness which is yet um, undetermined that uh, prompted this ban by the governor. Yes, so a couple things. Um, this, I, I view it as two separate issues. One, recently across the country and here in Massachusetts as well, there has been a series of cases that have popped up of young people of all ages um, with severe respiratory illness. And the governor's four-month ban was in response to that. At this point, it's unknown what's causing them other than the common element being they have been vaping. And so the governor said we should get all products all vaping related products, uh, including the devices, off the shelves until there's some determination as to what's causing it. Uh, meanwhile, um, long before that, w I filed legislation along with Representative Gregoire to address teenage vaping. The industry, the vaping industry, the big tobacco industry, for several years now has been targeting young people and we have seen rates of use among young people reach levels that nobody wanted to ever see, anticipated ever seeing. And so our legislation would be to ban flavored tobacco products in addressing that part of the um, vaping issue. Certainly, we know that this four-month ban is, again, only a limited ban. What happens after that? Well, and that's the purpose of our bill. Um, we don't know what will be determined as to the cause of the recent uh, respiratory illnesses. But we do know that big tobacco has been targeting young people. And our bill is designed to protect young people. So if the... Um, they determined that indeed it was flavored tobacco products that were causing the respiratory illnesses, the vaping devices themselves. Um, most of that can be addressed as, once that determination is made. In the meantime, I think it's important that we protect the next generation from the industry. Um, otherwise, I think what we'll see is that every six months, a year, or two years, we will see outbreaks such as this because there'll be so many people using these vaping products um, that um, you, you'll see these outbreaks. And so. Permanently, we want to, to ban the flavored tobacco products. And we should mention that across the country, other states are doing similar things. Yes, Michigan, uh, by executive order, uh, banned uh, tobacco product, I mean, uh, vaping flavors. Um, New York has done it, they, although they're going back to look at mint and menthol. Um, we think that's very important. The governor's, is, uh, Governor Baker's, is probably the broadest because it's a, a, a ban across the board, taking the devices, the flavors, anything related to vaping off the shelves. Right. And that there's been legal challenges. I was going to say that there is, there is fight back, most, uh, uh, mostly from retailers. Yes, uh, retailers, vape shop owners, that, that's been the pushback, and the governor's proposal passed the first test, so to speak, on that. The vaping industry went in and was looking for the order to be stayed, claiming financial hardship. And the first decision that came out on this came out last week and it said that the governor's ban shall stay in place. There are other challenges, so we'll see. And again, that comes back to why we think the permanent ban on flavored tobacco products is the best way to approach this long term and to protect young people in particular from the industry. I know that education and a, a lot of um, issues, education is key. Education is key in this as well. I know that uh, recently a check for $15,000 was given from Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital, Milton, to the Quincy Public Schools for just that, for education. Education is critical in everything, uh, and particularly when it comes to advising young people about products such as these. These products were able to kind of sneak up on this generation. You and I were talking about this. Yeah, they, they were designed so that parents wouldn't know what they were. Kids were told that they were healthy. And in some cases, the industry went into classrooms under the guise of offering health cl classes, health curriculum, and told students, this came out in congressional testimony, that they were, that they were safe products, that they were um, safe, healthy, weren't addictive, your parents won't find out that you're using them, and oh, by the way, they're cool. And so, and unregulated. And as a result, we've seen youth usage just go through the roof. 
I do want to, uh, to turn now to the opioid crisis, still a crisis, and any, any recent happenings? I know safe injection sites uh, is probably most recently in the news. The governor, Governor Baker, opposes those in the Commonwealth? Yes, there was a commission formed to look at harm reduction efforts in Massachusetts. Harm reduction meaning ways to reduce the harms associated with substance use. And that commission recommended a pilot program for safe consumption sites. It's been somewhat controversial. The governor has come out in opposition to it. The U.S. Uh, attorney for the District of Massachusetts has come out against it. Um, Mayor Walsh uh, was initially against it, but he's, he's come around and, and is supportive of the idea. It, um, the one of the reasons for opposing was that it wasn't legal. There was just a recently, just recently a court decision in Philadelphia, um, the U.S. versus Safe House, and the courts ruled that um, these safe consumption sites were not prohibited under the statute that the federal government had been using to prohibit them. So it's, it's still unknown what will happen. The legislation at the State House is broad right now. Um, it, it will get more focused, and the general idea behind it is that if there is a community that wants to do it, in a, on a pilot basis, then state law should permit it. And there is a community, Somerville, that has said we're interested in hosting one of these sites. And so the legislature is looking at giving them the ability, in terms of state law, to do just that. And they would do it because they have asked to do it and they're interested in doing it. And you and I, uh, before we sat down, uh, before the cameras were rolling, talked about the difference in marijuana sites and these safe injection sites. and the federal government. Yeah, what's interesting is that the federal government s says that there's a statute, or references a statute called the um, crack house statute, that y somebody cannot make premises available for use of a, a, a substance that's on schedule one. And um, marijuana is on that schedule, heroin is on that schedule, uh, crack cocaine was on that schedule, and that law dates back many years. And so the federal government has used that statute saying you can't have these sites because you'd be allowing illicit drug use, illegal drug use on the premises. Yet under federal law, the marijuana is still on the same schedule as heroin, and yet in Massachusetts, safe consumption sites or consumption, social consumption sites are going most likely to be permitted. So there is a little bit of inconsistency in the law, and I understand that they're very different drugs uh, and have different impacts. But um, nonetheless, I think we have to look at uh, the safe consumption sites with a lot of research, a lot of data, making sure the community is aware of um, current legal status, that the state is aware of the current legal status, and try to develop a program that if a community wants to do it, um, that they have the ability to do it under state law. One of the things I do want to address is the prescription drug take back program. Currently that's in place, but it could expire. Yes, we passed a um, drug stewardship program uh, a few years ago now, and it made the pharmaceutical companies that manufacture opioid painkillers responsible for taking unused, back unused medications, to get them out of medicine chest, out of people's homes safely. That legislation passed the Senate, a version passed the House, and then they went to a conference committee, and the bill that came out of conference committee put a sunset on it, meaning that the law will basically expire on a certain date. And that date is fast approaching, so the industry has just sat back and really hasn't participated much in the development of our program. I have legislation p filed and pending that would take away that sunset clause and make the obligation to take back unused medications permanent. They can take them back directly, or they can contribute to a fund that's then used to help with the disposal of unused medications. Recently, the uh, House Majority Leader, uh, Representative Ron Mariano, was in to talk about, among other things, drug pricing. That's also a concern. It is. Um, anybody who uh, needs a medication for a chronic illness or even an acute illness is sometimes shocked at the staggering cost of some of them, particularly when it comes to uh, complex diseases. And uh, so there are efforts to, to rein in the cost of pharmaceuticals. They are the biggest contributor to our increase each year in health care costs here in Massachusetts. It used to be a whole lot of other things, but the biggest driver now is um, pharmaceutical medication, is pharmaceuticals. And so trying to get those under control for the consumer, for our state budget, for everybody, and yet still making sure people have access to these important medications is a pretty tough balance, but hopefully we'll find it. I do want to uh, now address health care and disability services, something that is on your radar. 
Yes, we, um, we've been very active in this for quite some time. Um, there has been in the delivery of health care oftentimes cases where those with behavioral health disabilities or other disabilities don't quite have the access that everybody else does. And so we are constantly fighting to make sure that that access is there. And it also occurs in the field of education as well. We have about 7,000 students in Massachusetts that have uh, developmental disabilities that uh, can't be addressed through our regular public schools. And they go to the chapter 766 schools. And um, I have made it a personal cause to try to get everything that's available to our public school students in our traditional public schools available also for those 7,000 students who are in our chapter 766 schools. Whether that's access to uh, um, IT, whether it's access to building funds so that they have uh, facilities that are equal to the regular public high school, and just access to programs in general. Um, so keep working on that. I, I tried through the education reform bill last week. We were successful in bringing attention to the issue and we're just going to keep fighting for those 7,000 students who sometimes don't get the same resources that all the other students do. We should mention that the mayor, Mayor Koch, just unveiled a learning center in Quincy to deal with the folks with special education needs. And I think it's a great idea. Um, Quincy spends a lot of money um, in transportation costs and tuition costs for students um, to which they cannot provide the programming that's needed. So to, to have it available in Quincy would be a cost savings, but also just a, a great resource for students. And I've had conversations with the mayor, and I hope one of the things that, that he and the school committee and the city council focus on is identifying learning disabilities early and providing um, resources so that students can learn how to deal with those learning disabilities. Because what I've found in my work is that undiagnosed learning disabilities or diagnosed learning disabilities that go untreated end up being mental health issues sometimes um, when the young people, when they're adolescents or they're off to college. They manage to get through middle school and then in high school things start to, to catch up and then in college sometimes um, they realize that they're not quite prepared and it just goes back to the early identification of learning disabilities, making sure they have the treatment and then that really has a pretty positive impact on their mental health. Certainly. We should mention before we leave uh, this particular topic that the governor, Governor Baker, just recently appointed Quincy resident Mary McCauley as the director of the Massachusetts Office on Disability. It's a very important job and Mary I think comes from Mass Rehab if I'm not mistaken. We've dealt with her uh, on a whole host of issues, mostly constituent issues. Oftentimes we would get calls from people saying I've got an application pending or the services that are being provided don't quite meet the needs of a loved one. And so we have worked with Mary's office in the past in, in matching the constituents to the appropriate services. And she's always been very responsive. Her office has always been. So uh, congratulations to her. It is a, it's a tough job. It's uh, a job that's going to require a lot of hours. But um, I'm sure she's up to the task. Folks will uh, no doubt uh, know uh, about this next topic because we've talked about it on so many shows. But th the proposed compressor station at the Four River Basin. Where does that stand currently? I think the latest uh, I'm familiar with was the uh, addition of some air quality testing devices. Yes, that's the big, one of the biggest issues has been the air quality. Um, the Four River Basin is an area that where there's a lot of big industry, has been for many years. The air quality has always been suspect and proven actually beyond suspect that there are problems down there. Um, Germantown on the, on the Quincy side, for instance, is an environmental justice area, meaning that there are higher rates of certain illnesses that they attribute to long-term exposure to chemicals in the basin. So the, the effort has been to get the governor to pay attention to the air quality. And a group of legislators and mayors, the Mayor um, Sullivan, Mayor Koch, Mayor uh, Hedlund and Weymouth have all joined together, all the legislators, to try to push the governor to make sure that air quality is at a minimum monitored at certain areas and that if it exceeds levels that right now are, are questionable and, and that um, there's a rapid response to that. And So what's the likelihood of the compressor station being built? It depends who you talk to. Uh, okay. The governor would say that it's going to be built. Uh, a very active group, FRAX, uh, very active, very organized, very well informed, is pushing every single day to make sure that the compressor station does not open. Um, so it's it's there's some tension there, there's a struggle there, and I hope, and we've lent our support to the FRAX group, knowing that this just is not the appropriate place 
for a compressor station, not only in terms of air quality, but if anything should ever happen proximity. there. Proximity. Correct. As it has in other places, an explosion of any sort, its proximity to residents is, is alarming. There had been a leak a few years ago from the station itself, not even the compressor station that's being proposed, that really set off an alarm in the neighborhoods. Um, gas was in the neighborhoods, was there for a long time before there was an appropriate response. I do want to get into some transportation uh, issues, uh, topics, and uh, first of all, we'll start with some great news about the MBTA. The Wollaston station is open and uh, doing well. It is open. It's great. Uh, I, I took the train uh, to work three times last week. I used the Wollaston station, and it, it, it's a thrill to see it opened. Um, and one of the things that has struck me is that the uh, ways that you can get up to the platform and off the platform from a public safety point standpoint are really, really impressive. Um, people seem to be very pleased it's opening. The parking is working itself out, and so uh, that's a big plus. And we certainly talk about that, uh, or we don't need to talk about that. We just need to, I guess, bring it to light. Uh, folks with disabilities are now able to use that station. Yes. There was a woman who would come into my office. She lived over on Clay Street, and she would take her wheelchair and go all the way down to North Quincy to get on the train to come into the State House to push for the opening of the Walson Station. And she was there at the ribbon cutting, so that was a, a great, great story. So it is accessible now, and, and that, that is a huge plus. It's fantastic. Uh, overall, it's just a, it's another step in trying to get the red line in particular and our public transportation system overall to where it should be. We have a long way to go. I know the orange line was, uh, is shut down, I believe, on weekends because of maintenance. That's currently going on. Yes. Uh, so this past weekend, it was shut down from Sullivan Square, basically, to downtown, and they were using buses. And by all accounts, the buses worked well. There's some hope that they'll do a little bit more with designated bus roads. But that's the tack that the MBTA has taken, partially because they saw it work with the Government Center Project and the Walls and Station Project, that they are going to take um, more sections out of service at times that they hope will least affect the commuter to get more work done. They're pretty limited. When they do it overnight, by the time they stage, shut everything down, get work done, get it fired back up again and ready for the commuters the next morning, they get about three or four hours of work, um, actual work on tracks or whatever in there. So the idea is to do these longer periods and get more done. They will do that you know, as, as needed on every line. But um, red lines come a long way, but I know that people still struggle with delays, and um, the state is working, the MBTA is working to get beyond that. The signals are now back to where they were before the derailment that, that crushed the signals, and the new signal program is advancing. And was that um, the derailment? Was, it, was that determined that um, it was something that uh, was hard to prevent? Um, yes. They, uh, for, excuse my lack of technical <laughs> knowledge, oh, mine too. it was a bit of a fluke. Okay. It was something that was unique to that specific car and that specific chassis. It had to do with the conduction of electricity of some sort and the wearing of a part. Um, they would not have caught it and they did not catch it in their normal inspections. No other system would have inspected for that. The MBTA did go back, determine the cause, and now has that as part of their regular inspection process. So there's always something good that comes out of uh, something that's not so good. And um, so we got through that with the patience of commuters. We know what it is. Hopefully we won't have that experience again. And hopefully each day commuters will see improvements on the red line going forward. And let's talk about getting to a particular station. Let's talk about getting to the Quincy Center T station and the garage that used to be there is not there anymore. It certainly housed quite a few cars when it was open. Yeah, the garage had been closed for several years. And I, I was in the legislature. I remember getting the call basically saying, we're going to close it. Uh, we have to close it immediately. Structurally, it's not sound. And so it's been five or six years at least that it was closed. It's now been demolished. That was part of the Walson Station project. It was the same contract. And the city and the MBTA and the state are now working together to, to determine the next step for the station. There's been a designated developer chosen. They're in the mix. And so they will determine the appropriate development of the site and how they're going to put in parking and access to the station and to do all that in a way that um, best serves the MBTA, that they can generate some revenue, the city of Quincy, that they can have a development that's truly transit oriented and most importantly that helps the commuters uh, get to and from work to doctors and schools. And talk if you could about the recent happenings on the north end of the city uh, at the North Quincy T station. Classic case and, and the developer that's chosen here is, will be the one that will work with the city on Quincy Center. The MBTA was charged by the legislature to come up with their own source revenue and so they looked at the best way to do that 
and they recognize that there's also a housing shortage here in Massachusetts, and particularly the greater Boston area. And so they signed a 99-year lease with the developer, where the developer will develop that lot, uh, will develop the garage, will manage the garage. That will serve not only the development, but also the MBTA station. And it is pretty amazing how quickly that is now going. It, they're up out of the ground. You can see the steel. A lot of the underground infrastructure work uh, has been completed. There's still more to be done. But uh, it's a comprehensive project that will have retail, commercial, and residential all on that site, as well as parking for the MBTA and for those other types of services. Right. It was mentioned that uh, Target, a smaller scaled Target, will be part of that development. Yeah, that was announced uh, when they had the uh, ribbon car, the groundbreaking, technically the groundbreaking, although they had, they had broken ground previously. Um, and yeah, it'll be an urban style target, which means not a big, broad floor plan, but something that's a little bit more vertical. I believe Boston has a similar. They do, yeah. It's, it's, it's right kind of the new trend. Then you go to a lot of these um, developments that are transit oriented and you see them there. They don't have a big footprint, but they go up vertical and they offer less of a lot of the same things. The ferry service. Talk about the ferry service. Uh, you were at a meeting recently that discussed uh, possibly a ferry from the um, Squantum Point Park to UMass. Yes, uh, Representative Ayers and myself and, uh, and others uh, went to UMass, met with the acting chancellor over there, and talked about the possibility of tying UMass, Squantum Point Park, downtown Boston, and ultimately a much broader picture, the airport and other locations together in a, a transportation ferry transportation network. UMass is looking at Fallon Pier, which is, I think that's the name of the pier, um, and, and reconstructing that and sees a relationship with Quincy as a real possibility. And so we went out and looked at the pier. They came over. We did um, went into the North Quincy area, Squantum Point Park area. They saw what we had over there. It's almost like you can reach across and touch UMass from, from Squantum Point right, Park. Right, right. And talked about services that has been provided and what the plans are. We still... This summer, we were able to provide ferry service in partnership with Winthrop. Which, was, which went well, except for about three weeks. The ferry needed to right. be taken out of service, a mechanical issue. Yes. Yeah, just about three weeks. And so uh, it's back in service. It will you know, shut down at some point, and discussions are ongoing as to whether that will continue again next year. But we should mention that numbers from Quincy, yes. those numbers of Quincy riders are up. They were up. And it just goes to show that if you can have something, in this case, approaching reliable, that people will use it. And so Quincy's ready to, to take the next step that will offer, uh, the goal is to offer service within the true commuting times and make it very reliable, having uh, two boats that can carry about 120 passengers each that will offer trips in the morning rush hour regularly and in the evening rush hour and do it on its own. But until we get to that point, um, we'll see. There's a pilot program that the um, state is offering, the city has applied. And the MBTA and DOT, they'll be meeting with the applicants to review applications and make sure they're in proper form. And so that's a big step. Quincy has worked with Boston Harbor now to develop a business plan for a ferry service out of Squantum Point Park. So things continue to move, not as fast as some of us would like to see, but they are moving forward. A problem, I see it on the road on a daily basis. Handheld devices, mm -hmm. cell phones, folks really depending on them and not paying attention to the road. So I'd like to talk about legislation regarding hand-free cell phone use. Yes, um, a um, hands-free de devices law has, a uh, bill has passed the Senate, passed the House. They differed, and so what happens is a conference committee is formed where uh, certain members of the House, certain members of the Senate meet in conference to try to iron out the differences. The goal was to have that bill in place by the end of uh, to the governor's desk by the end of July. There was a version that was reported, reported to the clerk's office that the House thought had been agreed to. The Senate had not agreed to it. So the issue right now, while both the House and Senate agree that there should be a bill and, and a law that bans um, the use of handheld devices, the holdup seems to be on what information should be gathered when uh, a citation is issued, that would be the House version, or whenever there's a stop. That would be the Senate version. Okay. And so there's it's not the fact that I mean they all agree that it's yes. not the right thing to do to be Correct. holding your device. It's working out the details. What type of data should be gathered um, as a result of these um, stops or citations? Again, House thinks you should only gather data when there's a citation. Senate thinks whenever there's a stop related to handheld devices, handheld devices, the data collection should be should be done. Okay. 
that seems to be the sticking point. And hopefully that will be resolved <laughs> soon. Before we, just the last couple minutes actually, I do uh, want to give you the opportunity. I've asked all the questions, but if there's something that I haven't asked that you would like uh, folks to know about the current legislation. There's a lot going on and we continue to focus on, on local, is local issues and I would encourage people if they have a local issue that they're concerned about um, in terms of you know, state and local interaction to please call us at the office and the number is 617-722-1494. If they want information on any of the bills, the legislation that I'm working on, the best way to get to me is to, you know, to find out what I'm working on would be to call the office or they can just Google Senator John Keenan and um, the State House site will come up, my State Senate site will come up, and it'll have a listing of, of everything. Um, we continue to, to put all our, a lot of our efforts in the, into the vaping bill because that's the one right now that has um, drawn the most attention nationally and something that we think that we can act on pretty quickly here in Massachusetts and doing, do it in a permanent way that really protects the next generation of young people. And we continue our work on the opioid epidemic. We talked a little bit about that. We continue to push legislation that would allow or require insurance companies to provide coverage for up to 30 days of treatment. We were successful in getting a bill for 14 days. We want to get that increased to 30 so that when somebody is in the middle of kind of the traditional modes of treatment and needs to go to the next level, and when they pick up the phone and ask for that treatment, they know that it's covered. And one of the other things that we're pushing is to make sure that there are alternatives to opioids when it comes time to pain management. And uh, we were successful in getting legislation passed that required insurance companies to offer with coverage uh, a couple of treatment modalities, whether it's acupuncture or a chiropractor or, or physical therapy. And we're ex looking to expand that. The Division of Insurance has expanded that. And our legislation would remove the requirement of insurance company approval. So even though that bill has passed saying that they have to offer those services, we want to make sure that they don't have to call the insurance company and ask permission. They don't need permission to pre prescribe an opioid. They shouldn't need, meaning a doctor, permission to say this person is appropriate for acupuncture, physical therapy, or chiropractic care. Um, and the more that we can do of that, the less exposure people have to opioids, the less likely they are to head down the path to its dependence and addiction. It's how things used to be done back in the 80s and the 90s, and it was abandoned with the introduction of OxyContin. Just uh, as we close, uh, the, your, your thought on the Attorney General Mara Healy's fight with Purdue Pharma. We should mention that they have declared bankruptcy. Yes. Um, I stand behind the Attorney General 100%, not only in bringing the action against Purdue Pharma, but in her refusal, as of this point, not to participate in the settlement. Because it didn't target the family. They didn't target the family. Um, reading some of the pleadings in the, in the litigation, some of the discovery in the litigation, uh, watching some of the communication that was occurring between Purdue Pharma and the Sackler family, um, it turns your stomach. It is appalling. And that they could make all those billions of dollars and only pay a, a small portion of that in settlement, to me, is, is not right. Um, they've got to pay a bigger price and contribute more to a treatment uh, for people that need it as a result of their actions. It's not something that they did new. They were very experienced. They were involved in other medications. They knew just what they were doing. They targeted doctors. They targeted clinics. A generation has become addicted. Thousands and thousands have died. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, the SAC, we should have nothing left uh, when it's all over. And everything they have should be put back to help those families uh, deal with what the SAC was created. That's my opinion. Well stated. I want to thank you for uh, joining me today, and certainly we welcome you back um, in short order to talk more about uh, legislation on Beacon great. Hill. Thank you. Thank Always you. great to be here. Pleasure. Thank you. And thank you at home for watching. You have been watching a program of Quincy Access Television. Please continue to watch QA TV for more locally produced programming.